I V M. There's a quick survey to fill out on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It lets us know a little bit more about who's listening to us. And you know what? We're going to do a few prizes. So, I mean, like, we'll do a random drawing of, like, maybe 10 people, and we'll send you all some swag. Remember, that's ivmpodcast.com slash survey, where you can fill out the survey. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm Mihir Mahajan, and today I'm joined by Anupam Manur. We are going to talk about today things that matter to all of us in our everyday lives, which is prices of various things uh, that we pay every day as we go about making our meals and paying people who work for us, buying fuel and all kinds of other activities. Prices are always a core concern for consumers in any economy in the world. And one of the ways in which prices are addressed is the role of that the central bank plays in the economy. So Anupam, without further ado, let me first bring you in and say, India has uh, the Reserve Bank of India as its central bank. And RBI has a role to play rather than purely saying that the union government or the state government or somebody else is responsible for price or price hikes, the RBI has a role to play. Can you start us off with what role the RBI plays? Yeah, so central banks around the world are given different mandates and uh, without getting too much into the historical evolution of central banks and so on, which is a fascinating topic of study, if you ask me, right from, you know, the Central Bank of England, how it kind of uh, evolved from there as mainly a debtor to the king and who would control money supply thereby, right? So that core function, which is the control of money supply, has not changed, and that's across the world. Now, within RBI, of course, you have, you know, different kind of mandates over its course of history. So the RBI or the Reserve Bank was established in 1935, initially under the, you know, the British rule and so on. But independent India, RBI was given multiple mandates because I think we were in a position where price stability was not seen to be the primary concern, not the primary concern. And so RBI was tasked with looking after growth and thereby jobs and of course price stability. Now, these are the two most commonly found mandates across the world. Right? So central banks across the world will either have a pure price stability target or they'll have a price stability plus growth slash jobs as their mandate. Now, RBI, in addition to these two, was famously given a whole bunch of other things as well, such as financial inclusion. And that has led to a lot of problems, which I'll you know talk about in just a bit. But financial inclusion, financial literacy, priority sector lending, and, and a whole bunch of these things. Now, you know, this can obviously lead to problems because on one hand, you're looking at overall financial sector stability. Are you looking at inflation? And at the same time, you know, you're also trying to say that, yeah, you have to give out loans to, let's say, farmers, which even though you know that you might not get paid back. So there was at least a contradiction or a fundamental tension in some of these objectives of the RBI. All of that changed, of course, in May of 2016, the RBI Act was amended to finally say that, you know, RBI should be an inflation targeting kind of central bank. So the primary role of RBI was no longer you know, growth and all of those other things that I mentioned, but it was only to ensure price stability. So to look at inflation as the primary thing. So essentially, if we talk about government and running the country as a whole, historically, the union government and the RBI have been at odds at various times and there have been tussles and so on. And we have heard about this for decades. But primarily, I think up until 2016, when the RBI became an inflation targeting bank, there were objectives that the RBI was given that were also objectives of the central government in part. Growth, job creation, priority sector identification, farmers' welfare are also union government's objectives. But the union government kind of split the responsibility with the RBI. In 2016, it changed. And does that mean that the RBI now, because it has a singular mandate, and while the governor and some members of the board are appointed by the government, essentially is supposed to act as an independent body? Yeah, so I think the independence of the central bank is, you know, I mean, it's probably the one thing that all monetary policy enthusiasts or, you know, scholars are worried about. And 
the RBI is with that multiple mandates meant that they had to yeah pursue different objectives which were not in line with what the RBI is most equipped to do, it has the tools to do, and so on. And so therefore, they had to dictate, literally dictate banks to do things which were not necessarily either in the bank's interest nor in the RBI's interest as well, which is, as I said, give loans to, let's say, medium and or micro enterprises, even though there was no collateral, for example, right? And so on and so forth. And you're absolutely right in identifying that a lot of this tasks were the primary tasks of the union government or even state governments for whatever reason. So that was the fiscal policy angle, which was uh, very conveniently, I think, transferred. A part of it was transferred to RBI, uh, to the monetary policy side. And, and so therefore, you had one, a lack of accountability. So in very, you know, in many situations, you could just say, yeah, we, we are doing all the things that we can, but RBI is not supporting us. And famously, by the way, Chidambaram and few other finance ministers have blamed RBI publicly saying that they're not reducing interest rates. And that is what is hampering growth and job creation and so on. So that kind of tussle has always been there. And there's also multiple other kind of tensions. The primary being, of course, you, you have a central bank which is tasked with control of money supply. At the same time, up till 94, for example, the RBI would also lend to the government and lend indiscriminately without their own, I mean, uh, that that lending was entirely in the control of the union government. So there was something called the ad hoc treasury bills, which the government of India would, you know, would release. And the RBI was forced to purchase them, which is in essence, basically the government forcing RBI to print money and give it to them, right? And, and so up till 94, this was happening, which is terrible according to, you know, in, in a, any sense of the term, when you try to understand monetary policy, because again, you're supposed to control money supply and then you're forced to give money and print money and, and give it to the government, right? So it's again, fundamentally at odds with each other, these two objectives. So in 94, that was abolished. Luckily, the ad hoc treasury bills, etc. Was, was abolished in 94. But there has been, you know, this continuous trust, tussle between the two, where RBI is forced in many ways, both publicly behind the scenes, sometimes, you know, even on a personal level, etc., where they're forced to, you know, take monetary policy decisions which are not in tune with the RBI's own interest rate. But that would always be justified with this other mandate that they had, which was the fact that they had to also look after growth. So, you know, the government could say, yes, price stability is one of the things you have to look after, but you also have to look after growth according to your own mandate and therefore, you know, raise rates or don't raise rates rather, right? That, that was always the tension. So, so give me a sense of this. So let me ask you this. So the way the RBI controls money supply, one of the primary ways is that RBI is the bank to which all banks are required to deposit a certain proportion of their deposits right. on which the RBI pays an interest rate to the bank. Yes. Yeah. And how does that control money supply? So uh, it's not, I mean, RBI does various things, by the way. So they have a whole bunch of instruments at their disposal. And without trying to get too technical, which will bore the pants of our uh, listeners, RBI essentially sets the interest rate at which it will lend to the banks. So every bank is supposed to maintain certain deposits. And whenever there is a shortfall of this deposit, it borrows from the RBI itself. And there's a certain interest rate at which it pays. So as when that interest rate is high, it means that banks will obviously have to, you know, pay more in order to maintain those deposits. And, and that the payment that is done, extra payment that is done is passed on in some sense to the consumer. So the banks themselves will raise interest rates to the end consumer. So therefore, the end consumer will borrow less. So this is the chain of this thing. So RBI sets the policy rate. Banks will then increase their own interest rates. So depositors will get more. So in that sense, more money is sucked out of circulation and kept in deposits. And also lenders will, I mean, sorry, borrowers will borrow less because the interest rates have gone up and there is lesser money in circulation. So that is the way, very simplistically put, that is the way in which RBI controls the money circulation. Of course, there's other instruments like the CRR, which is a cash reserve ratio, the statutory liquidity ratio, etc., which we don't necessarily go into. But all of these instruments are fundamentally to control how much money is going out of the banking system into circulation in the real world and how much of that money is coming back into the banking system. And so so help me understand now how the availability of money, and in, in some sense, the interest rate is what we would call as the price of money, right? right? If I ask you for X amount of money right now, and the interest rate is 7%, then one year later, if I return you the money, I'm supposed to give you the X plus 7% as interest, which is the cost of money Correct. that I'm paying. Correct. 
So in an economy, when RBI controls the interest rates or at least uh, directs the interest rates by hiking or lowering its interest rate, the, the reference rate, the cost of money changes. Correct. How is the cost of money, how is the interest rate related to growth or at least in theory, how does that work? Yeah, so as you can imagine, when the money is cheaper in that sense, that is the cost of money goes down, that interest rate goes down, more people borrow. And when more people borrow, they essentially, you know, I mean, what do they borrow for? Either they borrow for consumption, it could be a home loan, personal loan, car loan, etc. And so they consume, which means there's higher demand. There's When demand is higher, then their production or supply will also kind of increase, uh, which means there are more jobs created, more income. So that therefore growth, you know, you can see growth. Or people borrow to invest, which again, you will see. I and mean, so if a big entrepreneur borrows a big sum of money and then invest that into a new factory, etc. They're producing things, again, employing people. So there's growth in that sense as well. So that's how interest rates are linked in some sense to growth, employment generation, and even other kind of, you know, secondary macro, you know, variables such as exports and so on. All of that is in one sense or the other affected by your domestic interest rate. For example, even the amount of money that's coming into the country is affected by the interest rate set by the central bank. So higher central interest rate set by the central bank means higher returns on investment that you get. And so higher kind of, it could be NRI deposits, it could be FIIs, etc. So there's all of that kind of plays through this interest rate mechanism. So all of this sounds good, right? Because in a country like India, we are always saying we need growth so that we need investment, we need spending so that there are more jobs created, more people have employment and we have a huge employment crisis on our hands right now. All of this sounds good. However, there is a, there is clamor when the RBI actually does contrary to this and says, we are going to raise interest rates, we are going to increase the cost of money. And isn't the government just right to say then, well, people actually need jobs, so <laughs> the cost of money should be low. What is it that I'm missing? Yeah, it's the inflation, right? So you could lower interest rates so as to trigger growth, but that will come at a price and that price is called inflation, right? So you can have a short burst of growth and this will, you know, you can always be almost guaranteed of a short burst of growth when you lower interest rates. But very soon, you're going to have a lot of, I mean, in, to use classic monetary policy language, you're going to have a lot of money chasing far too few goods. And that results in inflation because there's lots of demand now. Everybody can borrow more. They consume more. There's demand more. There's, you know, a lot more demand. But supply can't keep up pace with all of that, right? There's, a, there's always going to be a supply crunch in that sense. And that will lead to inflation in the short term or even short to medium term. And once you have inflation, then companies, people, everybody starts adjusting downwards, right? How much they consume, what they want to invest in. So immediately, once you have, you know, very high inflation, the amount of investments that come in will also reduce because, you know, you don't want to be investing in a high economy, right? Because the amount of returns that you get will not automatically have to be adjusted to this inflation factor. People will start demanding higher wages. So, and, and sometimes cost of production goes up. When cost of production goes up, again, People don't want to either invest that much or, you know, it leads to further inflation. So this is, there's very clear linkages, right? Empirical linkages that the higher the inflation that you have, the lower long-term growth that you have, right? So I think it's fairly well established in literature that a low rate of inflation and crucially, which people don't get, is low volatility of inflation leads to higher growth in the, you know, in in all economies across the world, right? And so if anyone is interested just to drop in some theories, you could read about the Phillips curve, which tells you that there is this fundamental kind of trade-off between growth and inflation. And so what people thought was that you could sacrifice in that sense, like how you were saying, right? Sacrifice a little bit of inflation for more growth. Now, that seems lovely. And that's what politicians always try to do. But what we saw with the economy of the US itself is that that inevitably catches up. Right. And so you can, you know, you can achieve slightly higher growth now at higher rates of inflation. But in, in the next period, if you look at the sequentially in the next period, what you're going to have is extremely low growth, but extremely high inflation. So you're going to very quickly give up that benefits of growth, but you're not going to come back on that inflation levels. So this is called the expectations augmented Phillips curve for anybody who's interested in reading the theory behind this, which is what Milton Friedman was talking about. Right. So that sacrifice ratio between growth and inflation, which people thought existed, exists for a very short period. In the long run, you're going to have low growth and high inflation as a result, which is what is called a stagflation. So this is what happened in India in 
2012, 2013, we went through a stagflationary episode. The US saw stagflation in the 70s and so on and so forth. So that you bring up some very interesting points. But at this point, uh, let's take a quick break. And then after the break, we'll talk about actual inflation in India, RBI's role in it, and how the union government and RBI interaction over the pandemic and afterwards currently has shaped some of this. So let's take a quick break. Hello, hello, hello. It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On this round is on me, Gauri meets Yash Kotak, co-founder and chief marketing officer of Bohiko. They discuss the future of the hemp industry. On Think Fast, Varun and Suchita analyze Cashify's business model and future plans. On the longest constitution, Priya explores the excesses of parliamentary privileges and the unsavory consequences they can have. On all things policy, the Takshashila folk outline a background of India's position in the advanced computing age. And on Tede Mede Raste, Keshav explores the age-old gates of Delhi, Kashmiri, Lahori, Turkman and Khuni. Do follow us on social media. We are IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, do tell a friend. It really helps us out a lot. Also, don't forget to rate us on any platforms you're listening on and you can also check us out on YouTube. We are also doing a small listener survey to better understand how you respond to our shows and advertising on the network. We would really appreciate it if you could spare a few minutes to fill it. It helps us build better shows for you. And finally, we would like to thank our sponsors this week, SBI Life Insurance, India Water Portal and Jupiter, a digital banking app. Welcome back. We are in conversation with Anupam about inflation, RBI, union government and all matters related to money. So uh, one of the things, Anupam, you mentioned earlier was in 2016, the RBI Act was amended to uh, make RBI an explicitly inflation targeting bank. Essentially, as a result of that, if I understand it right, the RBI adopted for itself a target rate of inflation, not a particular number, but a range. Uh, my understanding is currently it's between 2 to 6% of inflation. Uh, and RBI said we are committing ourselves to meeting this target over a substantial period of time. And as a part of the RBI Act, the RBI is supposed to take actions, whether it's adjusting the interest rate or whatever other actions it takes, in order to keep inflation within this band. Now, the second part of this act was that there may be failure on the RBI's part to meet the inflation target. If the RBI fails to meet the inflation target, according to the act, if I understand it right, the RBI was made answerable to the people in the form of parliament. If the understanding I have is the RBI was supposed to not let inflation go out of this band, for more than three consecutive quarters, the moment that occurs, the RBI becomes answerable to the people in the form of a letter or, um, or a report to the Lok Sabha that needs to be tabled. Now, with that explicitly being stated, we recently saw a news report that came out that said that the RBI actually failed to control inflation within that band uh, sometime in the last few quarters. There, were, there was a more than nine month, more than a year long period where the inflation was actually higher than 6%. Yet, the RBI did not write this letter and the government specifically exempted it from having to write this letter. So one is, we have been through very unusual times. Pandemic years are extremely kind of rare. And because of that, obviously, the measurement of inflation will also be affected. So two-part question. One is that, did the RBI actually fail? Is my characterization right? And two, is the government's logic to giving RBI a free pass by saying that inflation measurement was affected? So therefore, RBI need not answer. Was that right? Yeah. Okay. So that's quite a loaded question. So let's take it one by one. The fact that first we move from this multiple objective to a single objective, which I think has received, by the way, it doesn't, surprisingly, that doesn't have the universal consensus on, on that front. I mean, from economists and so on, a lot of economists don't like an inflation targeting mechanism. Now, we are not here to, of course, discuss the merits and demerits of inflation targeting system. But I'm just happy that RBI has clarity in its mandate. Now, whether we have to stick to this band, etc., we can, you know, refine it as we go on. But I was initially elated by the fact that RBI has clarity in its mandate, that it has to look at price stability and not anything else. It, it's no longer the mandate or the duty of the RBI to look at growth. So you could have negative rates of growth but it's supposed to look at inflation. It's not supposed to cut its policy rates because of growth. It only has to look at inflation. Now, I know I'm stressing this a lot, but it is absolutely crucial that we did this. 
right? Because in essence, what we have in, in India is this, I mean, there's there's been multiple instances of runaway inflation. Now, luckily, we've not had a hyperinflation of sort, but RBI has played kind of fast and loose with its interest rate according to the government at hand. Now, the, whether it's the famous baby steps that we took just after the you know recession of 2008, which led ultimately to that extremely high inflation rate into 2013, 2012, 2013, right? where retail inflation touched about 14 to 16 percent. The rupee fell to whatever, 70 to the dollar, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So you see that whole cascading effects of inflation, which people don't realize it as much. Now, you know, let's leave that thought aside for the moment about switching to this new regime. Specifically, what has happened in this particular period is that the RBI has failed. I think that categorization is correct. So as we've been saying, irrespective of anything else, if you've been given the mandate that you've got to look at inflation and you've got to look at inflation within this and keep it within this band, and the band is big, by the way. So you look at New Zealand, for example, they have a much stricter inflation target, which is just 2%. End of story. It's not 2 plus or minus, you know, et cetera percent, right? But the RBI has 4% as its target, plus or minus 2%. So the fact that it starts deviating from 4% is when it should have taken the action. It, it shouldn't have waited until it got to above 6. Now, that range is there as a comfort zone. So, which means that you can start acting once it breaches that 4% and is going above, you start acting to bring it back as soon as possible to that 4% level. You don't have to wait until it reaches 6 and, and breaches that 6%. So, the first failure was, it was exactly that, right? And, and so, that was the one bit. Second, that seems like a... The second part of that question, which is that RBI got an exemption for this because data collection was not as robust, is extremely flimsy, to say the least. Because one, I think all of that, that data, which when it was collected and reported and formulated and tabulated, etc., had gotten uh, approvals from all parts of the government at that stage. So one is that. Secondly, we have to realize that as it is, data collection on inflation trends, etc., in India is flawed. So it's, I don't know by how much more was it flawed during the pandemic that you don't consider it, right? I, I, I don't buy that argument. I, I think the real reason for this is that, of course, RBI, I mean, the, the union government does not want RBI to be increasing the interest rates now, which will hamper growth. Of course, because we are in an extremely fragile position on that count as well. And so therefore, you know, the easiest way to do that is to say, you're not answerable anymore. But I think this sets an extremely bad precedent once you start giving it. I mean, then what is the point of an inflation target? So this becomes then, I mean, there is, there's also precedence for this. The FRBMA is a good kind of, you know, a lesson to be learned because you have something called the Fiscal Responsibility and Budgetary Management Act, which tells that the union government cannot have fiscal deficit above, for example, 3%. Right? That's a target given. But there is absolutely no accountability for breaching the target. Now you can have, 3% uh, target and the union government has a fiscal deficit of 6%, there's no repercussions to that. And so once you remove that repercussions, you have no incentives then to keep it. So now the minute you give an exemption, you're going to have more exemptions later and one more exemption. There's always going to be, you know, you can always find excuses of strange times and troubled times and so on. There's there's going to be skirmishes all parts of the world, at right? all points of time. So. so let me, I mean, thank you for saying that so straight in a, such a straightforward manner. But let me ask you this now, the, the taking the conversation further, one of the things, I mean, inflation is ultimately supposed to indicate change in prices, right? Essentially, it's a change in prices and a change in price is felt by all consumers, even if the measurements, whether they show X or Y, essentially after a, long, after a while of a persistent inflation, prices go up and consumers do notice and the media does notice. It's not something that can be kept hidden. It's not like you can put it in an off-balance sheet account and say that we don't look at that or whatever. Price hikes are felt by all of us. And so in the last few months, we have seen a lot of media, a lot of activism around prices. We have seen a lot of protests around price and so on. So one of the things I want to ask you is this, that in this period that the RBI failed its mandate and the government uh, says that the measurements were not sufficiently reliable, we have continued to muddle through. The RBI has not acted to raise the interest rates and kind of attempt to control the inflation. Are we now starting to see the results of all of that in terms of one, we, our growth has been impacted very badly. 
and that's related to the lockdown and to the pandemic conditions as a whole but on the other hand when we are coming out of or looking like coming out of that situation we are facing us we are faced with we need high growth but we have high inflation so we need to also control the inflation which is which doesn't seem like an ideal position to be in and as a consumer people is rbi now kind of uh, being caught red handed is the government and uh, rbi together being shown up in the market by the price hikes yeah absolutely i mean okay so first i think let's make one thing clear is that rbi is not in an enviable position for sure it, it this is a real dilemma but that is why they're the central bank and central bankers are highly qualified supposedly by the way highly qualified highly trained people who are put in that position to take really tough decisions and again i come back to the fundamental point that it would have been a tough decision if you had a dual mandate which is why i'm happy that we have a single mandate but rbi is supposed to look at that single mandate now the rbi should not be concerned with growth that's the union government job the union government can take up slightly more expansionary fiscal policy if it so requires to you know deal with growth it can do various other things tax cuts it can do some amount of that but i mean i know those things can work sometimes in contradiction right but you can't have the rbi concerning itself with the growth prospects and letting inflation run wild so what will happen because of that is that once you if we're already see as you said we are seeing the effect now the latest retail inflation was at 6.95% and if you read the popular commentary of course the government would love to blame that on oil and you know rise in oil prices but also let me belly that by saying that you know if you look at core inflation which is takes out food and oil prices that's still at 6.5% Wow. Right. So that is that is massive. So you you know the various other measures of inflation, core inflation, he- headline inflation, and so on. But the idea is that even if you take volatile commodities out, which is basically food and oil, you still have inflation at about six percent. Right. So and so what happens because of that as we go on is that people will you know look at other forms of. I mean, for instance, when your FD rates are six percent and your retail inflation is six percent, what do you think people will do? right they're not going to save in the bank anymore so either they're going to go buy gold which will put a strain on the rupee which will make imports more expensive you know the, there is a huge cycle the macroeconomic cycle will kick in and none of that is pleasant so businesses will not if you have high inflation you can't plan properly you know you can't uh, plan for your whether it's operating expenditure your cost of production etc so investment historically we've seen that investment go down in periods of high inflation and when in- investments go down you will have lower growth lower employment and the whole uh, other parts that kick in right so i think rbi should look at inflation even in times of low growth it should look at raising interest rates now it should have done that sometime back so that it could have done it in small steps but now unfortunately i think that we are already late and remember this one thing that again i have to emphasize here is that in macroeconomics there is a huge lag always between policy action and end outcome so if the rbi raises interest rates today you will only see effects of that probably one or two quarters down the road which is 6 months down the road so if you have 6 months of sustained increase in prices i think that's going to hit you know the common man quite you know terribly and that means essentially that disposable income real disposable income will start shrinking and so consumption will start shrinking that's quite a worrying picture anupam that you paint and one of the ways to take an uh, a macroeconomic learning and a governance learning out of this is that governments at the union and the state level are responsible for prices and for growth in various ways through various actions that they take however they are also kind of politically in a democracy they are covered by their horizon right the time horizon for a union government is 5 years or a state government and sometimes with uh, coalition governments or uncertainties the horizon might be even lower in which case short term benefits always are more attractive Correct. to politicians and the ruling class and therefore they might have this urge constantly whether it's chidambaram or whether it's the current administration they might have this urge to propel or to uh, promote growth in the short term to kind of get more jobs get the economy going and so on and so forth which in the medium and long term is really essential to keep the economy moving on the other hand because of the mandate clarity now the rbi's role is to make sure the car doesn't go too fast and go off the rails Correct. in some sense and inflation targeting therefore in some sense in terms of clear responsibility division made sense and this failure can be really problematic for us but at least it's something that's very widely recognized now and maybe policy makers and 
government and opposition can all learn from this and make these mandates, the answerability to the Lok Sabha, the answerability under the FRBMA, they are not just well-intentioned things, they are actually policy tools that should be put in use. If they are put in use, we would not, we would not necessarily have the kind of conditions that some countries are unfortunately suffering very badly. I mean, Sri Lanka, we have yeah. all seen high inflation and we have seen what kind of economic trouble they are in. But I hope our policymakers and the RBI acts in time while there's still time to kind of uh, do it right and kind of consult uh, experts and take that advice. Yeah. But on that note, wishing you lower prices in six months, even though I know that wish is likely to be a folly. <laughs> but maybe if action is taken by the end of the year, we might be looking at taming inflation a little bit. Or head in that direction at least. All right. Thanks very much, Arupam. Thank you. Thanks. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. Do you find yourself in a room full of people talking about investments and insurances and feel left out? Do you also want to understand how to spend your money wisely? Then you have come to the right place. Welcome to SBI Life Presents A Sip of Finance, a women-exclusive podcast where we break down difficult financial topics into simple and straightforward episodes with your host, Priyanka Acharya, a finance expert who's been in the industry for 14 plus years. And not just in English, but in seven more languages. So tune in every Tuesday for fresh episodes on the IBM Podcast Network and all major podcast streaming platforms. Namaste, this is Cyrus Brocha. I am part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available. So what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show. It's called Cyrus Says. It's on IVM Podcast. You have to watch it and listen to it. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. There are many different ways. Don't bother me and ask me how. Uh, you have to find out. We talk to different personalities. Many of them are known. Some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai. But the point is, it's fun and it's very therapeutic. So please join in and listen to Cyrus Says. 